Welcome to Write Statements, an introduction. In this first session, you will hear from me, Molly Huber. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Minnesota Digital Library. Next, you'll hear from Nancy Sims, Copyright Librarian at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Later on, you'll hear from Sarah Ring, Continuing Education Librarian at Minitex. You will hear from Greta Bonneman, Metadata Librarian at the Minnesota Digital Library, if you view the next recording in this series, Write Statements, Working with Examples. In our slides today, we'll be covering the Minnesota Digital Library, Digital Public Library of America and Rights, Copyright Considerations, and Rights Statements Overview. So first, the Minnesota Digital Library, or MDL, the Digital Public Library of America, or DPLA, and Rights. One of the problems of aggregation, such as large-scale digital collections like DPLA and MDL, is that it magnifies differences. As the Minnesota Digital Library, and on an even bigger scale, the Digital Public Library of America amassed more and more records, we found that there are many different right statements that our contributors were using. So, DPLA joined with their European counterpart, Europeana, to form a working group to develop a series of standardized right statements that conveyed information about an item's right status in a uniform way. The result was 12 standardized right statements with standardized descriptions to cover all situations. These are available at rightstatements.org. There are 12 right statements at rightstatements.org. These 12 standardized rights statements are high-level summaries of the underlying rights statuses of the digital objects they apply to. They can be used by cultural heritage institutions to indicate the rights status of digital objects that they make available online, either on their own website or via aggregation platforms. The rights statements have been designed with both human users and machine users, such as search engines, in mind and are provided as a linked data vocabulary. The Minnesota Digital Library is asking their contributors to Minnesota Reflections to use the standardized rights statements at rightstatements.org to describe the rights status of materials shared with Minnesota Reflections at the request of DPLA, but also because it is a good idea. Having these rights statements in place makes it easier for users to know what they can do with the material they encounter and encourages reuse and sharing. To make it easier for contributors to Minnesota Reflections to implement rights statements, our project team has developed an array of training materials to assist in this process. I'm Nancy Sims, and I'm going to talk to you about some copyright considerations related to this work. The two big things to know here are that this work is a departure from a lot of previous copyright work in cultural organizations. And because it's a departure, that means it presents some issues that highlight common copyright misconceptions. What do I mean that it's a departure from previous work? Well, first, it's important to reinforce that we're not usually the copyright holders for items in our collections. That's perfectly normal. But most of what we've been doing around copyright for digitization work is trying to figure out, even though we don't own the copyrights here, can we use it? We can often answer that question without knowing who does own the rights in an item. The illustration here is an empty field. It's an analogy. We've been working in our collections in the same way we might approach walking across a field. We don't necessarily need to know who owns the field if there are walking paths all over it, or if we know that it's commonly publicly used. So what's different about this work is that we're no longer trying to answer the question of whether we can use it. Instead, we're trying to share what we know that we think will help other people know if they can use it. To do that, we need to pin down with greater accuracy whether anyone does own the rights, and we need to pin down more details about points where we are uncertain. Continuing the field analogy, instead of making our own use of a field, we are now the ones posting signs that inform people when and where they are able to walk through it. The illustration here is of a marker for a public footpath through a field in the United Kingdom. As we switch gears from our previous work focused on whether we can use materials to our current work posting signage for everyone, some common misconceptions come up and we should address them right off the bat. One common misconception related to our collections is that there's a magic year for figuring out whether a work has a copyright or not, and that magic year is 1923. But it isn't 1923 anymore. As of January 1st, 2019, it's 1924, and it will be moving forward each year on January 1st. Another trick about this magic year is that it actually only ever applied to published works. 
when we were looking at unpublished works and trying to determine whether there was a copyright or not, the 1923 year has rarely been relevant. Another misconception that this new kind of work highlights is this thought that it's easy to tell whether a work has been published or not. We found, when working with materials in Minnesota Reflections, that this was much more complicated than we thought. So just a note to prepare yourself that you may have to rethink your understanding of some items from your collections. Another misconception that this new kind of work highlights is this idea that rights statements and Creative Commons licenses do the same thing or mean the same thing. They often appear in the same metadata fields. But Creative Commons licenses are active legal tools where a rights holder can make a choice to share their work with the public. We don't usually hold the rights, so we can't usually grant Creative Commons licenses in materials in our collections. By comparison, status labels like rights statements don't do anything legally. They're not creating a license or creating ownership rights the way licenses do. Instead, we'll be able to describe materials in our collections regardless of whether we own any rights in them. I'm Sarah Ring and I'll be giving a rights statements overview. This is a very high level overview of the rights statements and examples of each will be given in the next recording and at future training that we offer. As mentioned earlier, there are 12 rights statements to choose from. They are intended to give users easy to understand information about copyright and reuse of digital objects. The rights statement should only be applied after the copyright status of a work has been established. The statements are organized into three categories on the website. In copyright, statements for works that are in copyright. No copyright, statements for works that are not in copyright. And other, which contains statements for works where the copyright status is unclear. So as you can see here, there are five statements to describe in copyright works. There are four statements to describe works with no copyright and three statements that fall under the other category. If you are currently or plan to be a contributor to Minnesota Reflections, it's likely that some of these will not be applicable. And in fact, we're making just six of these statements available to Minnesota Reflections contributors. So let me define these six statements, starting with the in-copyright statements. The following in-copyright statements are intended for use with digital objects that are in copyright. The in-copyright statement is for works that are still in copyright. Using this statement implies that you've determined that the item is in copyright and that your organization is either the rights holder or has obtained permission from the rights holder to make the work available or that you're making the work available under an exception or limitation to copyright. The next statement, in copyright, rights holder, unlocatable, or unidentifiable, is used for an item that's been identified as in copyright, but for which no rights holder has been identified or located after some reasonable investigation. This rights statement should only be used if you are reasonably sure that the work is in copyright. Contributors should be aware that copyright rights holder unlocatable or unidentifiable should only be used after serious inquiry. Under the no copyright category, there's just one statement we think is applicable to Minnesota Reflections contributors. No copyright United States should be used for items that you, as the organization making the items available, have determined are free of copyright under the laws of the United States. It doesn't preclude the item from being in the public domain in other countries. It means though that you as the organization has evaluated and determined that there is no copyright under US law. The statements that fall under the other category are intended for use with digital objects where the copyright status has not been determined with certainty. These should only be used if it's not possible to use a more clear rights statement. Copyright undetermined should be used for items for which the copyright status is unknown and you've made an effort to determine the copyright status of the work. 
So typically, this right statement is used when you're missing key facts that are essential to making an accurate copyright status determination. Copyright not evaluated should be used for items for which the copyright status is unknown and the organization has not undertaken an effort to determine the copyright status of the work. But use copyright not evaluated with caution. What this statement actually means is that you have considered copyright, but haven't figured out exactly who owns the work. But it might look to others as though you are saying, we didn't even bother to think about copyright before we started using this work. The last other statement is no known copyright. Use no known copyright when you have reasonable cause to believe that the work is not covered by copyright or related rights anymore, but the copyright status has not been determined conclusively, and that you're lacking some key piece of information to actually be able to make a public domain statement. DPLA expects it to be helpful to organizations who have archival collections with older material where the publication status isn't clear. To summarize, no known copyright implies you've done some investigation to determine the public domain status of the materials and that you think it likely that there is no copyright but are not very certain. If you are the rights holder and the item is still in copyright, here are some considerations. You could use the in copyright statement, or you could choose to make the work available under an open Creative Commons license. In this case, you would choose an applicable license instead of using the in copyright statement. There are many Creative Commons licenses to choose from that provide a simple, standardized way to give your permission to share and use your work using conditions of your choice. Or, you could consider designating the work as CC0 or no rights reserved, which in effect waives all rights in the work to the extent provided by law and places them as completely as possible in the public domain. Rights holders do this so that others may freely build upon, enhance, and reuse the works for any purposes without restriction under copyright law. If you're feeling overwhelmed by all that information, just know that we have created a quick reference guide that you might find helpful. We took these six right statements and organized them into a two-page handout, organized into three different categories that I talked about earlier. There's an in copyright section when someone else owns the rights. There's a no copyright section when no one owns the rights and there's an other section when you're unsure about the rights. We've also included a should you use column with additional notes. If you're looking for more resources and training, go to the MDL Rights Statements Resources webpage for more information. As a next step, consider viewing the next part of our Rights Statements introductory video series called Rights Statements Working with Examples. In that session, presenters will review the statements I've introduced here, but they'll also provide information about how to apply them in practice to works in Minnesota Reflections. The website contains links to a downloadable version of the Rights Statements Quick Reference that I mentioned earlier, as well as future training opportunities and other support resources. And you can always contact us with your questions. Molly Huber is our project lead, and you see her contact information listed there, as well as the rest of the team. Thank you.